Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com takes a look at the action on the major markets. He tells us what's behind Copper's big move upwards. Wolf Street's Wolf Richter delves into the automotive trade and also takes a look at Vancouver and Toronto's real estate market bubbles. Hilliard Macbeth, author of the book When the Bubble Burst Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash, tells us about the new edition of his book. He says the banks are not all that keen at taking over defaulted mortgages right now, but could change if the economy gets tougher. Plus, a reminder, we'll have company showcase updates from American Manganese President Larry Ray and Avon Resources' Jim Pettit right after the show. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain's Brunswick property is located in the Ridout Shear Zone in Ontario, with grab samples running as high as 32 grams per tonne gold. A follow-up drill program to test numerous targets located by recent groundwork is planned for early 2018. Please visit our website at rmroyalty.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. A bit of a different handle for you. Ross, can you tell us about the change from Chartworks, and is Chartworks still part of the works? Well, now that um, I've been uh, coming over to Bob Hoy's uh, work and uh, doing it on a full-time basis at this point. Uh, we took a look at the uh, uh, the naming on it, uh, both from a legal perspective. The word advisors is one that uh, is uh, I'm no longer an advisor um, officially legally, and uh, the uh, the name pretty much reflects what I do, which is charts, and what Mar- uh, Bob does, which is uh, the markets and commentary. So the uh, uh, it appeared that it was a good time to be making the transition. Now, uh, the website is uh, will be up and running by the 1st of July. Uh, it's uh, just in the final stages of just some touch-up right now. But in the meantime, uh, the email address for me will now be Ross Clark at chartsandmarkets.com. Ross, copper made a tremendous charge this week. It wasn't all that long ago. It was around 2 bucks. And now it's uh, okay. three dollars. Well, now, now, now you're talking about uh, short and long-term memory here. Too. Yeah, and and <laughs> two, here it two is. Two bucks was a year and a half ago. It's yeah, a year and a half. Time flies. Yes, <laughs> and, and here it is at three dollars thirty cents. Why the big move? Well, you know, we've been in a consolidation phase for the better part of what eight or nine months here at this three dollars to three thirty range. And, uh, you know, it looked as though it was probably going to have a pretty deep correction uh, in below the $3 range, maybe into the $270, 280 when we, as we were going through the winter. But uh, the economic conditions have been pretty good, so it held in. And then this week, uh, it, uh, we've got a, a strike uh, down in Chile, and that uh, is uh, affecting production. Now, how long these strikes ever go on is always very questionable, but... For now, if they're five percent of the world production, that's enough to give you better than a five percent run. We've gone from three hundred five to three thirty as far as the pricing is concerned. Uh, it's taken a lot of the stocks along with it really, really nicely. Um, uh, anything that was related directly to the copper price, um, the consolidation that we have now, uh, we take a look at it. If it's going to break out here, and it seems to be, have some volume behind it, so we can try and push further. Um, somewhere in that 360, 365 area might be a reasonable target for now. That's actually what we had been looking for uh, a number of months ago, um, anticipating a correction at first and then the run-up. But in this case, the uh, market's been even uh, more buoyant than we thought it would be. Ross, uh, bonds and uh, treasuries, how are they doing? 
Well, uh, the, in this case, uh, we've seen uh, the markets uh, hold very, very well um, after the uh, the initial breaks. Um, you know, you've had uh, yield uh, got up on the 10-year U.S. to about 310 uh, about four or three weeks ago, came off to 280 very quickly. Now more into a thrashing phase around the 292 range. Um, still think that over time, uh, interest rates are going to uh, work their way higher. The uh, the important part that we want, you know, and, and when the economy is strengthening, you expect to see interest rates moving up. I mean, the demand for money is there. The, the ability to pay for that additional cost of money also uh, can be uh, borne out by the uh, uh, by the uh, investors and by the corporations. So. Um, the thing that we need to keep a really close eye on here, though, is the spread between short-term rates and long-term rates. And as long as there's a flattening of that yield curve, the, it tends to be supportive to the equity market. So right now, the difference between a two-year government bond in the U.S. and a 10-year is about 42 points. Between a two and a 20 is 49 points. And these are at the lowest levels that we've seen since basically back in 2007. Um, and that's not to say that you crash after you've been up to those kind of levels like we saw in 07. What happens here is that as long as the trend in the spread continues to flatten like this, it will be supportive. It's when it finally rolls over and takes out an important uh, level that we've seen uh, during this move, and that change in momentum, change in direction, then is what has the effect in the stock market. So for now, this has been a good uh, indicator as we've pushed along. We had a deep correction in the equity markets, that uh, 12% correction into February, but from an economic point of view, from a fiscal point of view, there wasn't anything as of that point to be concerned about, and right now there isn't from this perspective either. Ross, oil has taken an $8 drop over the past couple of weeks. What kind of action do you expect in the crude patch? Well, this this has really been one of the ones that uh, we've liked. Uh, the, the whole pattern here is one of those ones that jumps out at us. When you see these methodical uptrends, and you know, think back to... Oh, Bitcoin of a year ago or the stock market of a year ago is, is they were gaining momentum and just stair stepping up. By the time we got to December, Bitcoin was producing upside exhaustion alerts in all three of our time frames we look at. We had good sequential sell signals. January got the same thing in the stock markets and then we ended up with the big correction. Well, looking at the oil market here, you know, we've, we've come from a 40, what, low 40s, I guess $42 pushed through a breakout at 54. So that was a nice breakout. And by the time in April we got up to pushing 70, we got indicators that showed us that May would probably be the top and that we would start to see a correction as of June. So here we are. Uh, the daily indicators all came into place in the latter part of May. We've now had this $8 break. And the extent of this break is important. Uh, we're now below the 20 and 50 day moving average, very clearly below. And there's no question, of, you know, whether we're just straddling or not. And the norm here, similar to all these other euphoric kind of moves, is that you get this first leg down, which we've now seen to 66 and change, uh, and or to 64 and change. And we should get a decent little bounce, uh, maybe up towards the 68 dollar range, and from there we would be looking for a second leg to the downside. So the key here, uh, now, and following that, the modeling, the larger modeling, suggests we're going back to new highs again. So in the short term, um, the low is in place, and we sent that out to subscribers this week. The first bounce, and assuming some, it's going to top out somewhere here in the next two weeks, can be another shorting opportunity, and you can look at a bear ETF like the DNO or the leveraged one and the DTO as a means of participating. Uh, you know, they were they moved what 13 and 25 percent on that last break, so there's you can get some pretty good action out of them. And then once that corrective low comes in, if we're right, somewhere in the next month or so, 
um, if we have that second leg down, we'll be um, scanning for individual stocks to pick up. So what we'd like to do at this point is uh, we'll give everybody a free trial for the next two weeks, taking us to the end of the month, um, and see if we can help them along in terms of discovering where the top might be on this oil break and uh, anything else in the way of our commentary or technical analysis that uh, might tweak their interest. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us. All right, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. Coming up, Wolf Richter next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Vatic Ventures Corp. is a potash exploration company focused on the Korat Basin in Thailand, the world's largest undeveloped potash resource. Vatic's management has extensive potash exploration and development experience in Thailand. Vatic will have marketing advantage compared to Western producers. Drill program commences this spring. Vatic trades on the TSX Venture, symbol VCV, and on Frankfurt, symbol V8V2. Visit our website, vaticventures.com. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Wolf Richter. He's the founder of WolfStreet.com. He's speaking to us from San Francisco. Wolf, welcome back to This Week in Money. Thanks for having me back, Jim. Well, first of all, let's talk about the car market. Is the new auto market an indicator for the underlying economy and or a measure of the availability of credit? In some situations, uh, during a recession, for example, uh, auto sales, especially new vehicle sales, are an indicator of the economy. Uh, right now, the economy is pretty strong in the U.S., uh, and auto sales are not. So um, they're, they're slightly down. Uh, so it, in the peak year having been 2016, um, what we have now is is a uh, a a growing crisis in the subprime sector of uh, auto loans and so uh, we've already had a couple of specialized subprime lenders collapse um, and major banks are tightening their credit uh, so lending to subprime rated customers was very loosey goosey in prior years and those loans are going bad now so the entire finance industry is adjusting to it, and the subprime rated customers are having trouble buying new cars. And that's in part why we see the new vehicle volume uh, decline a little bit, uh, because they're losing uh, the lower end of the credit spectrum. Now, these, these folks are still buying cars, but they're, they're being switched to used cars. And often it's the same dealer that will do that. They go to the dealer trying to buy a new car, and and they can't get the deal done, and so the dealer will switch them to a used vehicle uh, with lower payments and uh, 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 substantially lower payments and, and possibly a, a lender that is more willing to do that. Um, now, the rates would probably be higher, and the, you know, the probability of loss uh, uh, is, is similar but the actual loss on a used vehicle will be a lot lower, so lenders are a little bit uh, a little bit less tight about that. And so, in, and right now in the United States, with our uh, new vehicle declines, it's really not an indication of the economy, but it's an indication of the credit tightening up in the subprime sector. Now, it's an interesting, uh, uh, in a broader sense, it's an interesting thing to see that the subprime sector. Uh, is having trouble even though jobs are really good and the job market is, is strong and, and the economy is doing good. The uh, We see that in credit cards too. Uh, subprime defaults on credit cards and auto loans 
are rising significantly, and they, in, among smaller lenders, uh, credit card uh, subprime defaults have, you know, have reached financial crisis uh, levels. Um, but the economy is strong. Last time this happened, the economy was weak, and people got laid off. And so they couldn't make those credit card payments. They couldn't make the auto loan payments. Now the economy is strong and people are not getting laid off and they still can't make those payments. So this is an interesting development that, um, <laughs> that I'm going to keep observing because, uh, you know, it, it's really more a sign, not of the economy, of, but of how loosey goosey the underwriting standards were in, uh, 2014, 15, 16, and, and 17 even. Uh, because of QE and, and, you know, these low interest rates everywhere and the chase for yield and lenders get really aggressive with everything trying to make a buck and, and nobody, uh, uh took any risk seriously. And uh, now those risks are coming home to haunt us and it's before, before people are getting laid off. People still have their jobs and they're defaulting on these loans. And, uh, and that's a sign that the credit cycle is turning, you know, that, that things are in the credit market are going sour at the lower end of it, and uh, meanwhile the economy is still is still doing fine. The price of new vehicles has accelerated significantly in the past few years. Are the higher prices just designed to allow for deep discounting to make the customer think they're getting a bargain? Well, higher prices certainly allow automakers uh, to provide to offer deep discounts. Uh, I don't think they were designed that way. I've heard auto executives actually complain that they increase prices too fast and that they have to now use all these incentives to try to move to iron. And uh, these incentives are uh, are destructive in many ways to the industry. So the industry overall would prefer not to have to keep these incentives uh, on 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 the new vehicles. Uh, in order to maintain sales, they prefer, uh, you know, a lower level of incentives or no incentives and have strong sales. But they have, uh, over the good years, you know, so 2014, 15, and even 16, you know, they have uh, raised prices enormously. In the U.S., the average transaction cost after all the discounts is, uh, is about 32,200 U.S. dollars. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of money. That's, that's, you know, after, for a new vehicle, you know, after all the, the, the rebates and discounts, um, and people are having trouble buying cars. A lot of people are having trouble buying these expensive vehicles. So, um, uh, to move the market, uh, automakers are essentially cutting their prices. That's what they're doing, but they're not cutting their retail prices. They're not cutting the, the sticker prices. That's really what they should do, but that's not going to happen. Yeah, they'll never do that. And so they're they're adding incentives. In other markets, you would see price cuts. Yeah, the retail price would come down uh, if the if the item doesn't move. And uh, in the auto industry, that's not that's just not the case. The retail price stays the same, but the transaction price, the final price that the consumer pays, uh, yeah, they come down. And uh, it's, it's, they come down in relationship to the sticker price. Now, they're still higher. The overall transaction prices are still significantly higher than the war a year ago. So, yeah, they're they're cutting prices from sticker, but they're not cutting prices compared to a year ago. That's It's the opposite. They're still, they're still up. And, you know, the, the executives have, have admitted that. They've gotten greedy on the retail prices, and it's really haunting them now. So they've got to deal with it, and, and incentives is their way of dealing with it. Are most new vehicles purchased on credit, and is it getting tougher for consumers to obtain loans? Yes, and yes. <laughs> new vehicles are, are purchased on credit, or they're leased. In, 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 when they're leased, they're actually not purchased as leased. It's sort of like renting a car, except it's for a longer term. And the entity that owns the car is the leasing company. The leasing and uh, financing cars. Uh, new vehicles is is a big thing, and especially with rates being this low, still <laughs> being this low, you know, even though they've come up, uh, it makes a lot of sense to do that for people, um, even if they could afford to pay cash for it. Uh, but uh, the credit problems we have seen in the, among subprime rated customers uh, are impacting this. 
So uh, credit is being tightened on the uh, at the lower uh, ratings, uh, and subprime borrowers are having a harder time uh, getting loans to finance cars. Uh, the losses are soaring in that, so it, it makes sense for for lenders to to give this a careful look. Uh, in terms of prime rated customers, um, there hasn't been much of a tightening, um, and they they can still get pretty much uh, whatever they want if their credit is good, um, you know. And if they got a lot of money down, uh, there's no problem willing really financing their car. FCA just announced ten new battery electric vehicles <clears throat> by 2022. Is the electrical vehicle trend unstoppable? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. The the only thing that keeps electrical vehicles uh, from completely taking over everything in the uh, auto market is the battery, and that's been the problem since the first electric vehicle ever hit the road, which was in the 1800s. Yeah, the electric vehicles competed with steam-powered vehicles before the internal combustion engine had ever been invented. And back then, the battery was the problem. Today, the battery is still the problem. Uh, the batteries are getting much, much better, but they're still not really quite where we want them in terms of price, in terms of uh, the speed to charge them up. Uh, and, and how much of a charge they can hold and the weight. Um, so they they have those issues. There's some safety issues associated with batteries now too, as we've seen in some of the crashes. Uh, you know, when a when a battery uh, gets destroyed, it becomes unstable. So it catches fire. Uh, fire department extinguishes it, and then a day later it reignites. <laughs> and uh, batteries are are just tricky things. And uh, the technology is advancing very rapidly, and price points are coming down. Um, so they will eventually, and then eventually is not in the in the distant future. That's probably reasonably close. They will eventually advance to a point where uh, electric vehicles are becoming the thing to do. Electric cars and the electric powertrains are very simple, and they're cheap to manufacture. And yeah, in Germany and Volkswagen, are now big fears that that tens of thousands of people will be laid off when the company switches over to electric vehicle manufacturing because they're so much uh, easier to manufacture. There's, there's really hardly any moving parts in an electric powertrain. And it's much smaller, you know, there's hardly any maintenance. It's really an ideal situation. So for the manufacturer as well as for the consumer, uh, the problem remains the battery. So all manufacturers are now seeing the writing on the wall, and they're... They're getting very seriously behind the electric vehicle movement. Uh, everyone's got uh, low-volume electric vehicles out there trying to test them with consumers, you know, trying to build the infrastructure. They really haven't mass-produced any electric vehicles yet, uh, and they're not really eager to do that uh, yet. But uh, they're getting ready to. So I think uh, FCA's uh, approach mirrors that of many other companies. FDA, I think, is a little bit behind in some of those um, uh, projects. Volkswagen is far behind. Other companies are, are significantly ahead. Volkswagen really got into diesel cars, and so for a long time it didn't. Uh, yeah, it's the largest manufacturer in automaker in the world, depending on sometimes number two, sometimes number one. And it... It was in love with diesel and it just ignored electric cars essentially. Now since diesel gate, it's, uh, it's, it's walking away from diesels and it's really plowing into electric vehicles. FCA, uh, is a little bit late too, but it shows that, uh, even the reluctant manufacturers that haven't been, you know, they have been unwilling to, to really jump into it are now jumping into it. And, uh, that tells me that the industry is behind this. And that, you know, three years or four years or five years from now, um, electric vehicles will be economically uh, cheaper for consumers than um, internal combustion engines and uh, and probably will we'll find a lot uh, more acceptance than they do today. Why are automakers dropping car lines over the next few years? I guess the best example is Ford where they don't plan to make any cars except for the Mustang. Yeah, it, it, 
not making any cars in the U.S. I mean, they will continue to manufacture cars and and there are other plants around the world, uh, but in the U.S. they will essentially stop making cars outside of the Mustang. Now, the problem is the American consumer. It's not the automakers. It's the American consumer. You know, the automakers have been trying to shove these cars down their throats and consumers are just not wanting them. And, uh, you know, they, so automakers put huge incentives on, on them. The small cars, you know, automakers are losing money on them. Uh, it's really hard to, it's a very competitive market. Uh, the foreign automakers are dominating, uh, some of those categories. Um, so GM too, GM last year announced that it's thinking of dropping a whole bunch of car lines. Um, and in discussions with its union. Um, so this is this is something that is driven by American consumers. And American consumers love SUVs, they love the crossovers, which is crossovers is really when you think about it, it's really a car, uh it's based on a car chassis. Mechanically it's essentially a car uh that looks a little higher, it's a few inches higher than a car. It may have and it may not have four wheel drive. And, uh, but it, it's, it's based on a car platform and they're, they're considered trucks. So if you consider crossover cars, uh, Ford wouldn't actually stop making cars. It, yeah, it switches in that direction. And that's where consumers are going. They're switching from cars to crossovers and, uh, uh, and they're switching also to SUVs and, and pickups has always been popular in the United States, especially in, in truck country. And, uh, and that, that continues to be the case. Uh, but in terms of car switching, I think it's happening from from cars to crossovers and from cars to SUVs, and and Ford just just can't sell the cars anymore. You know, they're they're just sitting on the lot, and and that was always tough. You know, it was always tough to sell Ford cars. It was never easy in in the last few decades. You know, and and uh, uh, in the United States because yeah, it's just consumer preference, and and uh, we used to sell. Uh, when we, back in the day, in the 80s, 90s, you know, when I was in the business, uh, we used to sell 100 pickups for every 20 cars or so. You know, and that was in Oklahoma. So things uh, <laughs> haven't changed very much in that direction. You know, they've gotten worse. And uh, it's just American consumers just, uh, just are walking away from cars. With the price of fuel rising, is it a good or bad time to buy a gas guzzler? Well, from my point of view, it's never a good idea to buy a gas guzzler unless you really need one. If you're if you're a rancher and you need to haul stuff and and you got trailers you need to uh, to tow, you know, then a gas guzzler, quote unquote, uh, would be the thing to buy. Um, but if you're just commuting around town, uh, you know, a gas guzzler is just a big waste all around. Uh, there. Are, uh, SUVs and especially the compact SUVs and the crossovers that are fairly economical, and so um, you can get something that that suits your needs that isn't really a gas guzzler, or you can get a gas guzzler. and And if you don't need one, um, I, I think just in general it's a bad idea. Now, fuel prices are rising, uh, and that bad idea will become costly for people that do that. And uh, and it will give them second thoughts. So far, fuel prices have not gone up enough to where we've reached the pain threshold for, for most budgets. Um, but if fuel prices head up further, uh, at some point, you know, you'll, you'll see the market shift a little bit. But, you know, the main shift in the market is to, to cross over. And they're not really gas guzzlers. They're doing pretty good on fuel economy. Is the auto industry an easy target for tariffs? I cannot think of an industry that is more complex than the auto industry. It's truly globalized. The entire supply chain is globalized. So you might assemble a car in Canada and ship it to, you, to the United States. But the components in the car will come from China, from the United States, from Mexico, from Canada, from Austria. <laughs> they come from all over the world, you know. And, and uh, so if you put targets, I mean, you put tariffs on these targets, uh, you, you're, you're choosing, you know. So right now we're looking at, uh, at fully assembled cars as a target for tariffs. Uh, but, you know, the, 
if that car is manufactured uh, in Canada, uh, how much of the content of the car really comes from Canada? Yeah. You know, so what are your? I mean, and so you get into this this very complex and layered discussion. What what you're trying to accomplish uh, with these tariffs? Are you trying to to uh, yeah to punish uh, companies or plants that are uh, that are assembling cars so they take components and put them together, or are you trying to hit on whole, a whole industry? Uh, and it, it's just very, very complex, uh, especially when it's, you know, when it's a blanket uh, tariff like that against uh, manufacturers in any country. If you choose and you say, okay, we're going to target manufacturers in China because they impose a 25% uh, tariff on all imports, so we're going to reciprocate. We're going to do the same thing. You know that will be more understandable. But to try to impose 25% tariffs on cars that are assembled in Canada or assembled in Mexico, um, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, we're already doing that on pickup trucks. Pickup trucks in the United States already have these tariffs, and that's why most uh, pickup trucks are actually assembled in the United States. Otherwise, you couldn't sell them. Um, you know, so. I mean, it's very disruptive to the to the supply chains, and it's a very complex thing to do. Uh, there are going to be all kinds of uh, unintended consequences of this. The industry will adapt and shift around this. Um, so, uh, I, I think it's an yeah, it's an easy target. It, yeah, there's a lot of money involved, but it is such a complex industry. And it is so globalized. The supply chain goes all over the world. And it is so difficult uh, to try to target this ter these tariffs on the auto industry that I think uh, this, if, if that happens, you know, it's going to be fairly disruptive uh, in, in all kinds of unforeseen ways. We'll have more with Wolf Richter next on This Week in Money. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. Work programs are underway in Finland and planned for Canada this summer. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol ADD, on Frankfurt symbol 82A1, and the OTCQB symbol ASDZF. Please visit our website arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Wolf Richter. Wolf, how are the Canadian housing bubbles looking from where you are? They're pretty magnificent, I have to say, especially those in uh, Toronto and Vancouver. Uh, in Toronto, the housing bubble itself has probably uh, peaked last uh, year in April, so in April 2017. Prices have come down since then quite a bit, so that's in Toronto, the city of Toronto, as well as the greater Toronto area. And uh, in the higher end, so in uh, homes priced at $1.5 million Canadian dollars, uh, volume has essentially collapsed, sales volume. Uh, it's down by over 60%. So these uh, homes are not selling anymore. The market has, uh, there's, there's just too much, uh, uh, spread, too much difference between, uh, sellers and buyers. They, they can't come to any kind of agreement until the market sort of freezes up. At the lower end, uh, it's not quite that bad. Uh, even condo sales are down. Condo prices are still up. Uh, but the average home price in, in Toronto, uh, is now down year over year, has been down 
for several months in a row, year over year. Uh, so it's, it looks very much like uh, the house price bubble in Toronto is starting to deflate. Uh, given the, the magnitude of the prices, even a 5 or 6% decline or 8% decline from peak, that's kind of what we're looking at right now. Yeah, that, that's a significant, if you bought it at the peak, that's a significant hit that you're taking. And uh, uh, at the same time, you know, if you, if you own the house that you bought a few years ago uh, and you have no intention of selling it uh, and you like where you live, um, you know, you, you don't really feel a, a downturn in the housing market. You just, uh, you just continue on. You know, it, it, the problems arise at the margins. Uh, it's the people that bought most recently uh, that are now upside down in their homes uh, or uh, people that have credit problems, you know, and they're, they, they can't afford the payment anymore. They're trying to sell the home, and then they realize that, in fact, they cannot sell the home because what they get for it will not pay off the mortgage. And uh, those are the marginal problems uh, that a downturn in the housing market creates. Um, you know, this... Yeah, this is happening, and uh, it's so far that the numbers are pretty, pretty small. And the housing markets move very slowly. And uh, in the United States, you know, the downturn lasted four years, and and it started out pretty small. And people just said, "Well, it's plateauing. It's taking a breather." And they had all kinds of uh, uh, phrases to describe it for a year or two, you know, and then the downturn became more significant and it combined with a mortgage crisis and it combined with a financial crisis and then things got pretty iffy. Um, yeah, but at this point, it's just looking like a, a, a housing bubble that has started to gradually deflate um, in, in Toronto and, uh, um, and it looks like it's going to just wobble lower. Uh, Vancouver, uh, yeah, they're, and the condos are still very hot in Vancouver, uh, on the, on the housing, in the, in the house part of the housing market, uh, things have cooled off some, um, but I don't think Vancouver is quite at the stage where, where Toronto is today. Are housing bubbles deflating around the world? There is certainly not in lockstep, but, some of the biggest housing bubbles have now turned south. And, uh, for example, in uh, Sydney, Australia, home prices uh, are down year over year. Uh, in Melbourne, they turned down late last year. They're still up from a year ago, but only by minuscule amounts. But they've, they've you yeah, know, they started turning uh, south in, in late last year. In, in, in London, home prices uh, are turning down. Uh, so... In some of the hottest markets, we've, we've seen that happening. In the United States, uh, we, we've not seen that happening. We've got some magnificent housing bubbles here, too, particularly in San Francisco and some other spots. And um, I have not seen any data yet to show a year-over-year year decline. Uh, everything at this point uh, shows to in, continuing price increases. So it's not a lockstep type of uh, procedure. But uh, some housing markets around the world have turned south, and others uh, are still going pretty strong. There's not a lot of correlation between the two. And uh, uh, over the long term, there, there is. But in terms of, you know, from month, on a month-to-month and year-to-year basis, there's not a lot of... Um, Correlation, in part because the rental market, a significant part of the rental market, is multifamily. So that's commercial real estate. These are buildings with uh, with several or many apartments. Uh, many of them are owned by uh, by corporate entities, um, and they're subject to, to different dynamics. There's a lot of competition in that. We had a huge housing boom. Uh, in multifamily, and uh, so in, in some cities in the United States have already turned south. Uh, that includes San Francisco and includes New York City. Uh, Chicago is down over, is down nearly, rents are down nearly 30%. As, these are asking rents, including from new construction. Uh, in, um, in Honolulu, they're down over 20%. Uh, 
in some other cities, they're, mm -hmm. they're surging by 15% year over year. Yeah, so it's a very mixed market on the, on the rental side. Uh, so for now, I don't, uh, you know, San Francisco house prices, house prices are, are, are spiking, you know, and, and the rents are not. And, uh, so the correlation is very weak, uh, between these two. Uh, even though, uh, you know, if you take a, a very long term view, I think they, they move, uh, more or less in parallel, um, but uh, over the term that we're normally looking at, within a year or two, uh, they may move in the opposite direction, and and that's kind of what's happening right now. And and renters are yeah they're a different group of people, and they're they're more uh, uh, <laughs> they're more fluid. You know they can they can move every year, so the market is is more liquid. Uh, there there's more movement in the in the rental market than there's in the housing market. Um, so the things happen more quickly in the rental market. It shifts more quickly. So you have a, uh, a building that needs uh, new construction, you know, that has uh, 120 units that need to be rented out. Uh, they're going to cut asking prices until, un uh, uh, within reason, you know, until they can fill these apartments. That has an impact on the market. So this is a very responsive market. Um, in the uh, in the housing market, where yeah, you're 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 putting something on the market, it sits there for months, and you're trying to sell it. Uh, that is not nearly as responsive. So um, again, yeah, I don't, I would not expect to see any immediate uh, uh, correlation between the two. Is credit being constricted as interest rates rise around the world? Yeah, this is sort of natural uh, restriction in that the, the entities and the people that could afford uh, borrowing certain amounts at lower rates are having trouble to afford them in, at higher rates. Uh, at this point, uh, lenders outside of the subprime sector, you know, lenders have not really uh, restricted their underwriting standards in the United States. Um, in terms of corporate borrowing, uh, junk rated companies are not finding any kind of uh, tightening of underwriting standards right now. It's really a loosey goosey market in the, uh, in the junk spectrum in terms of uh, junk bonds and leveraged loans. Uh, they're really uh, they're very loose right now. So at this point, I'm not seeing a lot of tightening of the credit standards. Uh, it's very, you know, outside of the subprime sector on the consumer side. And um, rates are going up, but um, the tightening hasn't happened yet. The tightening will happen when the losses increase, when when lenders uh, and investors are are uh, taking some some bigger losses, and that, that hasn't happened yet. The Visa card system went down in the U.K. last week. Did that demonstrate the vulnerability of a cashless society? Yeah, that was a fiasco uh, uh, that many people had been afraid of for a long time, and uh, so it happened on a on a very large scale in the UK uh, last week, and uh, it impacted everybody that tried to make uh, any kind of payment with a Visa card. So uh, people trying to buy tickets for uh, public transportation. Uh, People trying to, it's Friday, Friday afternoon when this happens, you know, so people getting out of work, people going out, uh, people doing, trying to get home, you know, and, and nothing worked. And, uh, so it was a, uh, it was a very sobering experience. Uh, and, you know, even Visa itself recommended for people to try to get some cash and to, to make payments with cash. And, um, it showed really that in an electronic payment system, when electricity goes out or when the electronic payment system goes out or when the server goes out or when there's some other issue when it gets hacked, you know, uh, and this could be only in a relatively small part of the network, but it could block the network. And, uh, and then you're, and then you don't have a payment system. And, uh, uh, so this is a, yeah, this is a problem uh, that, uh, central banks have addressed. You know, there's been some discussion 
in um, trying to abolish cash because uh, for a number of reasons, you know, one, uh, governments really don't like the idea that people can do anonymous transactions and only cash is really truly anonymous. And, uh, uh, and with negative interest rates, uh, among some, some central banks, you know, there, if, if you have cash, you're not getting punished with these negative interest rates. So if you have your money in the bank, you would get punished, you know, and so you would have to take your money out and spend it. Um, and, and so there's some discussion as to, you know, among economists, how to abolish cash so that negative interest rate policies could be implemented and consumers wouldn't be able to escape them. Um, but this example in the UK showed that this is really a very risky strategy, that, that cash is still a very important backup system, and it's, it's essentially foolproof. Uh, it works on the, pretty much any conditions. You know, as, soon as, as long as you have some light to count it, uh, you can, uh, you know, you can, in the, so long as the transaction isn't very large, you know, you, you can use it. Uh, the, there's huge limits on cash. You know, nobody does a, a cash transaction anymore. Uh, nobody legal, at least, uh, that, you know, for the millions of dollars that some of, you know, the, some of the larger purchases, uh, like a home purchase, uh, will be. But uh, in terms of the small daily stuff, you know, uh, uh, cash is really a, a, a backup system for people that don't normally use it. And, and people like me, I love to use cash. There's no reason for me to use my Visa card for, for small purchases. I don't like to be tracked. I don't like everything that I do be, uh, being tracked. And so I use, use cash for a lot of stuff, you know, and, and it wouldn't, if the Visa system goes out, it, yeah, I still could buy the things I normally buy on a daily basis, you know. Uh, but a lot of people, my wife, for example, she doesn't carry any cash in her purse. And, and then, you know, you're, you're strung out and, and, and this example showed that it, you know, it it might um, you might get in trouble. Now Visa uh, transacts with other uh, payment systems too, and so they might also lose out. And so it could be a broader a broader issue. And uh, and so I think we will continue to have cash. Central banks will realize that cash is a is a solid backup system, and unless something has been invented. Uh, that no longer requires that kind of backup, I think we'll, we'll continue to have cash around. We'll have more with Wolf Richter next on This Week in Money. I'm Brian Fowler, president of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted historic engineer gold mine in the Atlan District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features through our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE, symbol CRL, and the pink, symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Wolf Richter. Wolf, is Prime Minister Justin Trudeau likely to negotiate a good NAFTA deal for Canadians when he has to negotiate that deal with President Trump? The question is, what is a good NAFTA deal for Canadians? And uh, what is a good NAFTA deal for the United States. And, uh, uh, you know, the interesting situation in this whole discussion is that Canada is just about the best trading partner the United States has. Our uh, goods deficit, I mean, the United States goods deficit with Canada is fairly small. If you throw services in it, the United States has a small surplus with, Can- with Canada most of the time. Uh, this is a very balanced trade relationship. There really, it's not a trade relationship that needs to be shaken up. 
uh, like the U.S. trade relationship with China. I mean, that really is a problematic trade relationship, and it needs to be dealt with. But the trade relationship between U.S. and Canada is is as balanced as one can get. And uh, so targeting the Canadian uh, uh, imports is it's just not <laughs> it's just not smart um, at the same time you know NAFTA has a lot of problems and NAFTA is very unpopular in the United States and it's very unpopular in Mexico uh, and NAFTA has produced a lot of failed promises in Mexico it uh, the one thing it was supposed to do which is raise uh, wages in Mexico it didn't do because of a system of wage negotiation that they have down there uh, in terms of the, the local government and, and the uh, automakers that, that move into Mexico where they guarantee certain low wages for the future. Now, this has kept wages down in Mexico. So the wage disparity between the United States and Mexico has not diminished. It may have gotten worse over the years. So NAFTA has failed Mexico. Uh, in many ways, NAFTA has failed the United States, too. When you look at the... Uh, manufacturing jobs that the United States has lost uh, during NAFTA and the people that used to have those manufacturing jobs now don't have manufacturing jobs. You know, they now work in fast food and in other services and they make a fraction of the money that they used to make. So there's a lot of resistance in the United States uh, to NAFTA and in Canada there may be some resistance too and that's why it's so important to come up with a deal. Um, a good deal is one where the trade relationship between the United States and Canada remains balanced and or disputes can be uh, dealt with in a fair and equitable manner and, uh, and there will always be trade disputes. Uh, that's, and that's the nature of the beast, you know. There will be always differences and there needs to be a settlement process in way, uh, 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 there needs to be a settlement process uh, as part of an agreement that uh, allows companies uh, to to get some some predictability in their their relationships at the same time some of these trade agreements have uh, consistently uh, diminished national sovereignty you know over local laws etc we've we've had one of those issues in the right in the United States just recently uh, that was a uh, I think that's what that was under the WTO where we labeled our beef by origin, so we get a lot of beef uh, uh, where the cattle is raised in Canada and uh, or in Mexico. And and so we want to know where our beef comes from, where it was harvested, and, uh, and for a little while. And Congress finally, after many years, passed a law to do that. And then there was a, a ruling by a trade organization, and that was the, the WTO, that said, no, this is, uh, this is, and it was filed by Canada and Mexico against the United States. And so we as consumers, and they won, and we as consumers now no longer have the right to see where this beef comes from. And there's labeling law that was, uh, uh, that was uh, Congress in Washington that passed the law, and it was overridden by the WTO based on a complaint by Canada and Mexico. And these are the things that trade agreements do. Now, they impact national sovereignty. And as a consumer, I'm really pissed off <laughs> that I no longer know where my beef comes from. Let me decide. You know, I'm, I might like Canadian beef, and so when I see it comes from Canada, I might buy it. You know, I might prefer it over Mexican beef, so let me choose, you know. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, you know that that's exactly how trade agreements work, and uh, so for and Canadians are on the receiving end of the same thing. You know there are certain Canadian laws uh, that will be uh, done away with because of a trade agreement, and, uh, and so when when you negotiate a trade agreement, uh, you know there's companies uh, that the negotiators have in mind, but they should also have in mind the people of those countries. And uh, so the Canadians and the Americans and the Mexicans. And generally, trade agreements don't have the people in mind. They generally have the companies in mind. And that's where we run afoul of, of some issues. So I hope when uh, Trudeau and Trump are negotiating this deal, and I, you know, maybe a two-party deal would be better than a, than a NAFTA-type three-party deal. Because our relationship, the U.S. relationship with Mexico is different than the U.S. relationship with Canada. And maybe you need a different agreement here. 
But uh, I think it will be very uh, complex to tr- negotiate something that's uh, that's good for the people of Canada and good for the people of uh, the United States. And that's what they should be doing. But I'm pretty sure that neither Trump nor Trudeau are really worried about the people. They're worried about the companies. And uh, and that's who the primary, uh, uh, you know, beneficiaries are of trade agreements. Were the steel and aluminum tariffs put in place by Trump for security reasons due to the subpar quality of imported steel and aluminum? There is some, uh, yeah, there, there's some question about that. Um, it's, all these these products are standardized. Now, there's different grades of steel and, and so forth. And so uh, the, the raw uh, steel shouldn't be of inferior quality. Uh, but it, it in the United States, you know, we've we've essentially uh, abandoned in in many ways um, our ability uh, to make steel products, and uh, it, it's one of offshore. For example, here in San Francisco, we we have a new Bay Bridge, and uh, a part of it, you know, part of it fell down during during the last earthquake, and it was patched up, but. Uh, uh, and that was the sixth part, the candy leave part, and some people died when that happened. And so they, for 20 years, you know, they, they tried to build and finally succeeded in building uh, the the eastern span of the Bay Bridge. And it is now a, it has a part that's a suspension bridge, and that suspension part has a uh, steel tower, just one, uh, that is made in China and that was shipped over in sections and assembled. Uh, on location, and we have now all kinds of problems with this uh, suspension bridge. And some of those problems are derived from uh, rods and bolts that were made in the United States that are already snapping, and those are the rods and bolts, steel rod and bolts, you know, that, that are supposed to keep the bridge in place during an earthquake, and they're snapping without an earthquake. So that's not good. We've got some quality problems in the welds and the steel parts that came from China, uh, and the design problems, the cost overrun. So, I mean, this was a really huge steel, uh, project and, uh, and it was determined that the biggest part of it, the tower would have to be made in China to save some cost and maybe too because it was, it was kind of abandoned the infrastructure in the United States to make those big, uh, projects. And, uh, uh, so there are now quality issues, but the quality issues are on both sides, US and China. Um, and but it, it's really a national security issue to that extent that if you lose your ability to make steel products, if you if you if your industry you know just sort of withers and you lose your engineering capacity and you lose your infrastructure to do that and your plans to do that and you don't update your technology, you know, gradually you're losing your ability to to build your build bridges to build uh, ships. Uh, to build uh, defensive products, you know, uh, Navy uh, ships and other uh, tanks, you know, cannon and all kinds of things. And uh, in that sense, it beca- and aluminum is the same thing. You know, aluminum is used heavily in aircraft. So the, a, a country like the United States needs to maintain a certain amount of high-quality steel and aluminum production. And... Uh, uh, and so there, there are some security issues with that. Um, you know, the subpar quality, that, that part can be dealt with with uh, quality control on site. So if you buy a, a tower, bridge tower that's made in China, you know, you have inspectors over there and they, they look at the entire supply chain there and they make sure that these things are happening properly. Uh, that's the case in the auto industry. They're... they're uh, Quality controls are very strong, and so uh, if if uh, TM uh, has components that are made in China, you know the quality controls are there to make sure they're okay. Uh, that's not always the case, maybe in some of those steel parts that we're seeing, uh, and so that's an issue. But that part is solvable. What's what's really more critical is for a country like the U.S. not to lose its ability to uh, to manufacture steel and aluminum products, specialty products. Uh, and even uh, uh, the crude steel, you know, so that we're not dependent on China for this. And I think that's a that's a pretty important consideration. 
Is consumer debt out of control? Yeah, in, in Canada, you know, consumer debt is largely associated with with the housing uh, sector, so with mortgages and with uh, uh, home equity lines of credit. Uh, so, homes being used as an ATM, uh, home equity, you know, being used, turned into cash essentially, and, and, and spent on things like uh, movies and vacation and food. Uh, in the United States. Uh, there's a similar trend, but it's not as big in mortgages. But our uh, big trends are are in credit cards and auto loans and in student loans. And uh, in those sectors, um, especially auto loans and and student loans, consumer credit is really seriously out of control, and uh, and it will cause some problems. I mean, student loans is a it's a nasty thing, you know, when you think about it. Uh, because there's, you know, the people are getting out of, uh, university with, with, uh, maybe a graduate degree, you know, and they're starting to work and they've got a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand dollars in debt, uh, just from the education. And <clears throat> if they're in a field like kind of teaching history, you know, they, their ability to pay off this debt is very limited. And so it handicaps them in the spending uh, in other ways, you know, so they, they won't be able to buy a house, they have trouble even renting, uh, they can't buy a car, so it impacts the economy uh, significantly. You cannot, in the United States, you cannot get rid of uh, student loan debt in bankruptcy, so you can shed all kinds of other debt in bankruptcy, but not student loans, so uh, that is a debt that uh, the borrowers will have to deal with, and um, and it has, it already has a pretty good impact on the economy uh, among those people that, that have this debt. And then there's a lot of students that have very little debt or no debt, and they're fine, you know, but the heavily indebted students, that's a huge problem. Credit card and auto loans, you know, we've already seen, we've discussed that, you know, there are already uh, problems in the subprime part uh, because, not because they're losing their jobs, but because uh, they can't make the payments, you know, interest rates are high on those subprime rated loans and, and, and they can't make the payments. And so, yeah, they're out of control and they're, uh, you know, there's some losses now associated with that. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I think it will, it will balance out and that consumers at that level will have to eventually cut back and, and, uh, and, you know, and it, you can't, the consumer debt cannot completely go out of control because the consumer will will stop being able to make the payment, and then in that point, at when the default sets in, it limits the loans, and all the loans get shut off, and the consumer, that particular consumer, can no longer borrow. And uh, um, yeah, so there's a self-limiting aspect to this, and it's probably starting to kick in in the United States. Could the U.S., led by President Trump, avoid a recession? I would say the probability of that is pretty low. Uh, we're now in a red height cycle. The, the Fed has been very consistently but slowly raising rates. Uh, this expansion has been going on for a very long time. A lot of excesses have been building up. Um, you know, we're, we're primed, we're primed for a recession. The you know, credit cycle is turning, uh, uh, you know, consumers at the, with that prime credit uh, are starting to default on the loans. I mean, these are the kind of predecessor, uh, movements, uh, to a recession. And, uh, it's not going to happen in 2018, I don't think, you know. But next year or year after next, you know, there is a very good chance, uh, that there will be a recession. Nobody will be surprised by that. Um, you know, it's long overdue. Recessions are, are unhealthy, a healthy part of the economic cycle. Uh, they, they say in terms of if it's a you know, if, if it's a run of the mill recession, not if it's a financial crisis. You know, if it's a run of the mill recession, it uh, it you know it blows out the cobwebs. You know, it gets rid of the excesses. It it causes all kinds of defaults that uh, and bankruptcies that will allow companies to shed some of their debts, and it will get rid of the zombies. And 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 then what comes out of it is a is a more vibrant economy. So a, a recession is not something that should be avoided forever. 
you know, the, the longer you avoid it, the bigger the, the excesses are and the, the harder it will be to deal with the consequences. And eventually there will be a recession. Now, there, there, there's no such thing as an economy without a recession. And, uh, yeah, the, the question you ask is whether this will happen under Trump or whether it will happen after Trump. And, well, Trump's first term, it's got three years left, a little less. Um, so there's a very good chance that, that the, a recession will at least start during, during his first term. What effect is nationalism likely to have on the U.S. dollar? The U.S. dollar had a terrible time last year, and uh, somewhat ironically because the Fed had already started raising rates, and that should have been really a, a, a supportive to the dollar. It is now supportive to the dollar, so the dollar's been, been going up. It hit a low sometime in February, and it's been rising since. Um, so... Uh, all the trade war rhetoric has been around last year and this year. It has sharpened this year. Uh, and uh, so this uh, this trade behavior that we're looking at now, um, yeah, impacted the dollar last year and it impacted the dollar this year. And last year the dollar went down and this year it's going up. So uh, I don't know how much impact it really has you know it uh, i think there are other things that are more important in the you know the cycles that the dollar goes through at this point it's in an up cycle uh, i think that will last for a while longer uh, i think a rising dollar is a is a somewhat problematic for uh, you know certain parts of the uh, emerging economy uh, economies in, in in other parts of the of the world particularly south america um, that are really dollar dependent, uh, but yeah, the the trade relationships I think uh, will sort of leave the dollar doing its own thing, and like it like they did in 2017 and in 2018. Now the dollar goes up, dollar goes down. The trade relationship <laughs> we're the same, you know. So. Um, Unless we have a, a collapse in in something, you know, where the dollar becomes either uh, something a safe haven type currency, or it becomes the opposite where, where people feel threatened. Yeah, but that's not. I don't see that happening. You know, I, right now, I I just think that uh, the trade disputes that are being dealt with, more or less, uh, being dealt with. Um, I, I don't think they will drive the dollar higher or lower. I think uh, the dollar will, will continue to rise this year uh, independent of that. Gold and silver are still stuck in a trading range. Do you see any near-term hope for gold and silver? You know, if you own gold and you own silver, uh, that's great. And I think you should enjoy the ownership of it, and it's a great thing to have. Uh, I just... Uh, I, these cycles are very long. With gold and silver, uh, you're looking at a decade or two in terms of cycles. And so when they have, uh, when they run up, you know, that, that run up is a decade or longer. And then when they go down, you know, it can be a decade or longer. It can be two decades here. And, um, uh, I, I just don't have the patience to wait uh, for the cycle to turn, you know, uh, if you own gold, you own silver, I think you just don't worry about it. And, uh, you just hang on to your metal and you just enjoy them. And at some point you'll discover that, oh, it went up. Now, if you're trading on a, uh, daily or monthly basis, uh, and you're not, you're not selling and buying the physical, but you're, you're trading derivative products, um, and futures, uh, you know, then then you're looking at short-term movements, and uh, gold and silver have been in that in that trading range for a number of years now. Uh, yeah, if you're lucky, uh, maybe you can capitalize on some of those movements and pretty sharp movements too. So uh, uh, it's not like there there was no volatility. There's some volatility in it. Um, so I think you know if you're into trading gold and silver, that's that's one way of looking at it. I I would not expect. Uh, gold and silver to change direction in a long term way uh, soon. I just I just don't think the downtrend is long enough yet. It's just 
in terms of gold and silver, it just started. You know, it's just a few years ago. It's a, it's very young, and um, uh, you know, they're in terms of gold. You know, it, the gold price drops, and gold manufacturers, uh, gold gold miners stop uh, mining gold. Um, yeah, gold doesn't get burned or consumed or eaten. Yeah, it it stays above the ground, and and so unlike oil, you know, there there won't be a shortage of gold. So there's no natural uh, force that will drive the price of gold up uh, as, as there is with other commodities. So that's why these cycles are so incredibly long, and uh, why they're so incredibly difficult to uh, to predict. You know, because most people, I mean, you can you can make a career writing up a gold cycle, or you can make a career writing it down. You know, it, it does just last a very very long time, and uh, and for now, I think, um, you yeah, know, if you're betting on the trading range, I think that's a pretty good bet that, that that's what we'll see. How can people find out more about Wolf Street? Wolfstreet.com. Everything's there. Wolf, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you, Tim. My guest has been Wolf Richter, publisher of Wolfstreet.com. He was speaking to us from San Francisco. Coming up, Hilliard Macbeth, next on This Week in Money. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerVan Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX. For more information, please visit us at PowerVanSolutions.com. Cypress Development Corp.'s flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. My guest is Hilliard Macbeth, author of the book When the Bubble Burst Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. He's also a portfolio manager and financial advisor in Edmonton. Welcome back to the show, Hilliard. Nice to be with you again. Stephen Polos, the governor of the Bank of Canada, he says Mother Nature is busy at work in Vancouver and Toronto. So what is Mother Nature doing to the real estate market? Well, he feels, I think, based on knowledge, of course, I wasn't at the speech he was speaking. I think actually in Vancouver to a group, and uh, he was making the argument that this is just a normal cycle and um, kind of like nature will take care of it. It's in the nature of things that uh, that these bubbles form, and then they uh, and then they gradually dissipate, and and uh, basically no harm will be done, which is uh, wrong in my opinion. And uh, I looked. Uh, in the research for my 2015 book and then again for the new edition coming out uh, in a couple of weeks, I looked all over the world for examples of that kind of fairy tale uh, soft landing scenario that he's talking about. And it just doesn't happen anywhere. It's never happened anywhere. And, and even with bubbles that are much milder than the one we're in in Canada, especially Vancouver and Toronto, but all across Canada really, uh, even milder bubbles always end with a pretty sharp correction afterwards. Um, uh, but major bubbles, like the type in Canada, especially because it's all across Canada, um, they uh, they 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 end up bursting in a very uh, drastic fashion. And so I would say to to uh, Pelos that Mother Nature also includes hurricanes and tsunamis. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, you know Mother Nature isn't always uh, gentle and, and kind. Well, I know it's just like when they say our, our product is full of natural ingredients, and I said, "Well, don't forget, rattlesnake poison is natural. <laughs> hey, arsenic is natural. Is natural, yeah. Natural doesn't help you out at all. So, in this no, kind of he, a climate, uh, do do people buy homes, or are they putting a lot of homes up for sale? Are people buying them? What's the mood? Well, so the prices, the Vancouver's an anomaly still. Uh, and it's mostly in the condo market where, 
according to the official reports, prices are still rising in the condos. Now, that can be skewed because it's always an average, right? And it could be skewed because maybe a new building has come on stream with uh, more luxurious apartments. And there's no lower price. To, you know, there haven't been very many good lower priced apartments uh, for sale for quite a long time in Vancouver. So the average price just keeps ticking up and people keep stretching to get it. But in a single family home in Vancouver, it's basically been flat since 2016. And it's starting to show signs of dropping. And in Toronto, the single family home and the condo market both are dropping. Uh, especially uh, more expensive homes are dropping by up to 20, 20, even more than 20%. So that's a sign, but it's fairly gentle so far. But what's really dramatic in the numbers that sh- are showing up is the number of sales has, has really dropped. So they basically are talking about uh, numbers of sales that are equivalent to February 2009, which is basically uh, right at the very low point of the last recession. And uh, everybody was scared. Um, you know, General Motors is being bailed out Chrysler was being bailed out. It looked like maybe the the world was the global financial crisis was going to bring an end to the financial world as we know it. So of course people would be would be uh, um, reluctant to make a commitment for a large amount of money to buy something. So for the number of sales to be as low as that as that as, as that month is very very uh, very odd, especially in May when we are um, you know supposed to be at the peak of the peak sales of the market. And then the second thing that's showing up. In addition to the number of sales being really low, the second thing is uh, the number of new listings is jumping much higher. So there's a huge new surge of inventory on the market pretty much all across the board, Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, and elsewhere. So uh, there's going to be lots to choose from for people. And uh, the only uh, caveat I would say on that is that prices have really not dropped as much as you do. You know, so far, even 20% in Toronto, for example, just to pick a single family home. Um, let's say the average was a million, now it's say 800,000 in some of the suburbs of Toronto. Well, you don't have to go back very far, uh, maybe five or seven years to when that same home probably would have been 600,000. So, is it too soon to jump in? I would argue it probably is because these, these, uh, these these uh, corrections after a huge bubble like that uh, usually don't stop at 20%. In the U.S., it, the, the number, the prices came down 35 to 40% before the uh, before the bottom, and then it took four years for the market to bottom. So that would indicate that uh, there's lots of time. There's no rush, and with all this new um, these new uh, listings, it, it would be interesting to see how many of the people listing for sale are desperate to sell, because that's where you get the real bargains. The, the best bargains come when the lenders start forcing, the lenders start taking over the properties, um, the people holding the mortgage and uh, uh, banks and other lenders, and they start dumping those homes on the market. And we haven't got there yet. That, there's there's always a few of that. There's a little bit of that going on. But even in Alberta, which has basically been in a recession since 2015, um, we haven't seen widespread uh, numbers of homes being foreclosed yet. So uh, if somebody's trying to get a bargain, that's uh, what I would suggest they uh, they wait for. But if somebody's just looking for a place to live, they're selling something to buy something, well then it's a great time because you've got lots of choice. We'll have more with Hilliard Macbeth right after this. Glance Technologies owns and operates Glance Pay, a disruptive mobile payment technology now live in 16 cities in Canada and about to launch in the U.S. With revenues up 664% in the last quarter, Glance Technologies has the potential to be a worldwide leader in an industry projected to grow to $1.3 trillion in three years. Glance Technologies stock symbols are GLNFF in the U.S. and GET in Canada. Find out more at glancepay.com. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp Inc., MGI on the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected high-grade gold including 16.9 meters of 13.58 grams and 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program is planned to further evaluate previously identified subsurface high-grade gold mineralization. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Hilliard Macbeth, 
Hilliard, do you think the banks are going to put more pressure on mortgage holders or are they going to try to give you the best deal they can to keep business going? I think so far, and Alberta's a good test case because we really have, uh, you know, business has been slow in Alberta and people, lots of people have been laid off or, or, you know, people were so heavily indebted that even just losing the overtime, which they were enjoying at work, um, you know, they could almost count on an extra twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year in income from just from overtime, and that's all gone now. So uh, even just that amount being lost is putting households under pressure. And so far, the lenders have been very, very um, uh, easy going. You know, they they talk about uh, forbearance is the official term, and um, the unofficial term would be extend and pretend. So they instead of seizing the property, putting it up for sale, which the lender has the right to do. They've got all of these uh, programs, uh, and CMHC has them as well, where they'll help you with the um, with the mitigation of your situation if you've lost your job or something like that. And 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 what the, what they end up doing is lending you more money and adding it to the total size of the loan. So, and 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 you know, from the lender's point of view, the reason they do that is because um, the record shows the Canadians will do almost anything to hang on to their house. Like the the last thing. Uh, people want to do is, is is walk away from their house, and so uh, so the lender is actually um, probably gambling a bit, but probably making a pretty good gamble unless unless the um, the current uh, downturn turns into something worse, in which case the lenders will will change from being your friend to being a very harsh, uh, um, rough kind of group to deal with if they decide to get nasty about it and. Uh, the last time the lenders in Alberta got nasty was the 1980s, and it got very, very nasty. Uh, um, and and the reason that uh, that's where you, where you get the real bargains is um, the lenders don't have uh, the big banks. They don't have a department that manages real estate. They don't have a group of people. They just they just uh, when they end up taking title to these properties, they just dump them on the market, and that's when you get the real bargains. Um, you know, like 40, 50 percent discounts. Um, and we haven't got there yet, and we, you know, we may never get there, but, but um, uh, based on the size of this bubble, it's quite likely that we will get there. With the the attitude the Canadians hold on to their houses, no matter what, is part of the uh, feeling here in the U.S. If you declare bankruptcy, it just doesn't have the same impact or stigma that it does in Canada. That's right. Well, and also in the U.S., you could. You know, it was a little bit easier to walk away from your home in the U.S. There was there was a number, not all the states, but a number of states. Um, you could you could have non recourse, so you could basically walk away, and uh, and uh, the the lender couldn't pursue you for the difference. But in every province in Canada except Alberta, uh, they can come after you. So if they seize the home and they sell it, they dump it on the market, and of course they never get a good price, because it says foreclosure, and everybody knows, it's a, you know, so the people bid low for it, and so it's brutal, they never get a, they always get a really bad price when they sell your seized home, and then they come after you for the, differ, the difference, which means you'd have to declare bankruptcy to get away, and, and bankruptcy does clear, clear you of all debts, including the, the debt on, the, on, on a foreclosed home. So, uh, but, um, the, the, the U.S., there still was a pretty big stigma in the U.S. They, there were a whole bunch of people. There's even something like, um, I, I think I saw the number, I think it was 9 or 10% of the people in the U.S. still have uh, homes where the mortgage is, is, is valued higher than the value of the home, even today. At the peak, it was something like 30, 35%. So people did hang on to their homes, and for whatever reason, they, you know, they, um, they continued to make the payments, even though, uh, the debt was bigger than the house. I think, I think that that shows the belief that house prices in 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 people's minds always come back. So it's just a question of waiting. Um, but there are some people who just can't do it, right? And the uh, the interesting thing that happened in the U.S. I don't know if it'll happen here if if this hap- if this um, crisis comes to Canada is um, people stop making their mortgage payments, and uh, it took the on average it was twenty four months, two full years. Before the bank caught up to them, so they actually they actually got to live mortgage free and rent free for two years in the home, and the banks didn't get around to uh, to uh, there were so many homes I suspect or or uh, maybe the banks didn't want to recognize the loss, um, 
but they uh, they, they just carried on and nobody bothered them. And eventually, the, I guess somebody shows up and says, "Hey, you haven't been paying your mortgage. <laughs> We're going to seize your home." So, uh, so no, it is. Uh, it happened in the U.S. and uh, but it'll be worse in Canada because, ex- with the exception of Alberta, and it's also even that exception. You have to meet a whole bunch of requirements to qualify for that ability to walk away from your home. There's a bit of a myth out there that all Albertans can walk away from their home, but uh, that's not true. Um, the lenders got smart after the last crisis in the 1980s, and they put in a whole bunch of new clauses in the mortgage agreement. So very, very few people will be able to walk away from their home. So then the question becomes, well, will the banks and, and eventually CMHC and the government, will they pursue them for that for that uh, deficit if, if, if these homes... Uh, become um, get sold it as a loss, and I'd, we don't know. Like if a whole bunch of people are in that situation, you could see that maybe the government or somebody would step in and say, "Well, what's the point of of evicting all these people from their homes? Maybe we should, you know, give them an offer where they live there, rent as renters for a while until they can get back on their feet." I, I don't know. Well, in Britain, that's what they do all the time. Millionaires get their mortgages paid for by the government because all of their money is offshore, so technically they have no income. I thought that was Vancouver. (laughs) (laughs) Could well be. Hilliard, you have a new version of your book, When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. What's new in version number two? Well, there's a bunch of new things. First of all, I updated all of the um, charts, uh, so that all the brand new um, graphs and charts with new information brought right up to date. And also, I added a whole new section, um, which is titled A Shaky Foundation, which is a, a three chapters, I think it's three chapters, about how the policy, economic theory, the government regulators, the central bankers, and everybody, uh, I, I'm sure, it's, I don't call it a conspiracy, but it was a... a uh, a framework and an environment that allows these bubbles to form and then doesn't stop them when they burst, even though the amount of damage that these uh, these bubbles create, uh, both on the upside and the downside, is enormous. So it's very, very puzzling to think that um, economists and central bankers and government and lenders, banks, um, are all uh, allowing these things to happen. And so I explain that in the book. And one of the one of the key fundamentals of that, which I explain in the book, is the fact that uh, the central bankers don't actually create the new money. The new money is created by commercial banks all over the world. So when when that home buyer goes in and gets that mortgage, uh, that money is brand new money that is printed by the by the basically by the um, by the bank, the lender. Um, at the moment that you sign those mortgage documents, and and that is what drives the housing market, and uh, and actually drives a lot of the economy, not just the housing market. So, it's a uh, it's a fairly new uh, interpretation of how the money supply works, and how how. But it it the the um, the good thing about it is it explains much more accurately what actually causes these housing bubbles. So, for instance, in Canada, the regulator would. Uh, the, which is called OSFI that regulates the commercial banks says, well, we we trust the banks that they won't do anything uh, too risky and they won't put their shareholders at risk. So we leave it up to them to make sure they're not taking too much risk. So there's no overall supervisor that says, hey, maybe it's crazy to be putting out all these new mortgages at a, at a growth rate of seven percent a year for 15 years. You know, maybe that's a dangerous thing to do. There's nobody watching over uh, the system to do that. And, so I went to other countries like Japan, where it happened, and then it, and then and then the bubble burst in 1989, and they are now in their 28th or 29th year of of living with the aftermath of that. Australia, the U.S., uh, Great Britain, and uh, so that's all new in the book. So I think people will find that very interesting, and 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 uh, you know you get a lot of these confusions. Like you have central bankers, like in Canada and in England and in um, and especially in the United States that talk a completely different language, which is actually incorrect. And uh, the mainstream ec- ec- economists, um, there's over 500 economists working for the Federal Reserve in the United States, PhD economists working for the Federal Reserve. 
they don't stand up and contradict their leaders and say, wait a minute, you, you know, you're talking about the central bank printing money. It's actually the commercial banks that print money. They're not going to stick their neck out. So um, the average person out there has understandably has trouble understanding this because, um, and I actually was shocked at some of the things I, I discovered in my research between the first edition in 2015 and, and the second edition in 2018 uh, about how it all works. And um, so that, I hope that people will find that very interesting. Well, one difference between Canada and Japan is Japan doesn't have any immigration and they have a very low birth rate. Canada has a very high immigration rate, although we do have a low birth rate. Would that make a difference in real estate? Yeah, I mean, it, it does to a degree. Uh, the uh, other thing in Japan was that the um, the bubble, prior to 1989, the bubble actually was not with, the households aren't crazy about getting into debt like we are in Canada. They went back in the 1980s in Japan. It was the commercial uh, lending. So the commercial uh, there was that famous thing where the uh, one part of um, downtown Tokyo was was allegedly worth more. The land there was allegedly worth more than uh, all of the land in California or something like that. And uh, so they got really crazy on on uh, and the banks got involved, lent the money, and then uh, and then when the land prices went down, the uh, the banks were all in big trouble. And instead of dealing with the problem. They just uh, allowed the banks to uh, become zombie banks, as they're called. So um, one of the professors that I met, uh, he's based in England, Steve Keen's his name, he calls seven countries in the world zombies to be. So J Japan was a zombie country and a zombie banking system for the last more than 20 years. And the future zombies to be are China, South Korea, Canada, uh, Australia. Those are the... There's there's seven of them and, and those are the four big ones and then there's uh, three others, Norway and uh, Hong Kong and one other. So, but Canada, Australia, and China especially are, are are the future zombies to be because they've allowed the credit to uh, expand so dramatically, and at some point um, that has to has to recede. It's interesting, even if the growth of credit, which I mentioned a minute ago, was 7%, even if that declined to 3%, uh, it would cause a massive recession in Canada because we've just become addicted to that extra boost that you get from all that new debt. Um, so if all of you, if you and me and all of our neighbors decided to stop going deeper into debt and collectively decided, hey, we better pay down our loans, um, it would have a massive impact on the economy of Canada because we're basically living off of um, a credit bubble. Is it bad for you to pay off your debts and uh, trim down your lifestyle? So interestingly, good question. Um, it's, it was identified uh, 100 years ago by John Maynard Keynes, almost 100 years ago by John Maynard Keynes, and it's called the paradox of thrift. And what it means is individually we can do that and it's a great for us individually. But collectively, if we all decide to do it at the, at the same time, it would destroy the economy. I mean, think of all the, all the house builders would be out of business. All the car dealers would be out of business. Everybody would go out of business. All the restaurants would go out of business. Um, because all of that is basically on credit. So, um, so hopefully, I, you know, obviously not everybody will do it. A lot of people will, will keep running their credit just to the max until they, until they, somebody hits them over overhead with a, with a hammer or, or a, um, drops an anvil on them or something. But, uh, a few people can decide to change their lifestyle and, and, uh, pay down their debt before it's too late. Uh, and that doesn't hit the economy. It's just that everybody does it collectively. That's the problem is, and and what that means, uh, basically, and this has happened, it happened in the U.S. and it it's happened in several other countries, is when people are forced to, as in the U.S., uh, what happened in 2009, 2010 was people were forced to start paying back their debts. Um, they didn't they didn't choose to, but they were forced to. Um, so what happens is the government then becomes the the uh, entity that has to go deep into debt, and the, and so the the um, the government the United States went massively into debt over the over the years after 2008 2009 um, 
and that will happen in Canada as well. The, the federal governments and the provincial governments, um, but probably especially the federal government, will have to pick up the slack. When the households stop going deeper into debt, uh, but we'll still have to go through a recession uh, as time goes. The good news for Canada, this is really good news actually, is the federal government has a very low level of debt compared to the other G7 countries. The debt of the federal government of Canada is only about 30% of GDP, so it's um, it, uh, some of the other countries like the U.S. and France and that close to 100%. So we've got room to increase our our our, our, our um, federal government debt by quite a bit before we start to look like Italy. And uh, that's the good news. But it won't be fun and it won't be pleasant and it won't be, you know, it'll be without a whole bunch of arguments and stuff. And people say, oh no, the government has to stop going deeper into debt. Well, the government doesn't have any choice, right? It's, uh, it's like, it, it, the only choice is do you do it wisely or do you do it stupidly? Those are, those are the choices. And um, uh, probably if it goes like it did in the other countries, Initially, they'll do it stupidly, and then eventually they'll get smarter and do it yeah, more uh, more intelligently. But it's uh, it's not going to be a, an easy thing to get through. Hilliard, when will the new version of When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash be published? So it, it's, it's on its way to the bookstores now, and you can pre-order it. Um, I noticed I just went on Chapters online, pre-ordered Chapters in... Uh, uh, I noticed on Amazon it didn't look like the pre-order site was there yet, but officially it's out June the 23rd, so basically a little bit less than three weeks from now. Hilliard, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Hilliard Macbeth, author of the new book, When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash, his website, macbethgroup.com. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Wolf Richter, and Hilliard Macbeth. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show, you can email us at info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Now stand by for company showcase updates from Larry Ray from American Manganese and Avon Resources' Jim Pettit. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Larry, welcome back to the show. Always glad to be on the show, Jim. Larry, we hear more and more about recycling every day. Where does your company fit into the big picture? Well, I would have to say that we are probably the leaders in recycling lithium-ion batteries, I say that with some confidence. Um, I see other companies out there. I see, uh, for example, that uh, Tesla is now talking, uh, you know, about their recycling program. They don't go into any detail or talk recoveries, but we do, and uh, and uh, nobody else seems to be anywhere near where we're at. So I'm really happy with the progress we've made. I'm happy with the uh, work that Cometco has done. We see all kinds of new opportunities developing for the company down the road, and uh, we're moving ahead with our with our uh, work on the testing of the product uh, to end up with a uh, actually a working battery that uh, and uh, development of the full patent and. And on that regard, we've uh, we've applied for the, and it's been published. Our patent has been published, and uh, so that's a that's a big plus for us. Uh, I'm hoping it took a year and a half for the original patent to go through on manganese, and I'm hoping it's going to be closer to a year for the patent on the uh, recycling. There's no way that we can speed that up, except that I can say that uh, the uh, Publishing of the patent uh, was uh, something like about 40% sooner than the uh, publishing of the uh, the manganese patent that we initially did. 
So that seems to be moving through the chute quite well. We've got a tremendous amount of interest uh, out of Asia, uh, specifically China and uh, Korea. And uh, that is, uh, you know, is a big plus in our books. Uh, they're going, we're doing, going through a lot of due diligence. Um, we still believe that we are the most advanced recycling solution out there. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's getting to be more and more in the news. So that should be greater and better for us. And, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of effort and time. Kometco, uh, is an excellent uh, research lab. And they brought us, uh, you know, they brought us forward. And it's just as simple as that. And that's all I can say, Jim, is we're glad to be in the position that we're at right now. And uh, we would uh, we'd like to be further advanced, but we've been at this less than two years. So uh, some companies, uh, you know, Tesla's been working on a solution for 10. And uh, other companies have been working even longer or as long as, or, you know, several years anyway. And uh, it was all because of our manganese patent that we were able to uh, spot a solution very early in the game back in 2015. And uh, we started to develop that solution in 2016. And now we're here talking about uh, recycling uh, up to 100% of the uh, total cathode materials in a battery. And that's that says something. So uh, I can't say that uh, we're disappointed with anything that's happened. Everything has worked out well. Everything that we planned for has came to fruition. And uh, I see this is going to be a huge, huge, huge landscape. The, uh, they're talking about uh, huge numbers of batteries being developed in the next uh, five years to ten years. And, uh, you know, certainly there will be other recycling opportunities out there, but we want, we would like to be think that we could be leading that whole herd. So uh, we certainly are in the technical part of it, and uh, there's a good chance that uh, with the right partner, that uh, we could be dominating that market. Larry, where is American Manganese traded and under what symbols? American Manganese is traded on the uh, Venture Exchange, and uh, it's under the symbol AMY. It's traded in the U.S. under symbol AMYZF, and it's traded under the symbol, uh, under the... uh, the uh, German, German exchange under the symbol 2AM. And uh, so we get action on all those exchanges, not as much in uh, Europe as we'd like to see, but uh, that that's developing. And uh, so we, we're on three exchanges. Uh, we have no intention of moving to any senior exchange at this point. And, uh, you know, because I, I believe the exposure is just as great on the venture as it is on the uh, full Toronto Stock Exchange. So we, we're too busy uh, developing a product rather than uh, being too concerned about uh, going to a senior exchange. Larry, how can people find out more information about the company? They can uh, phone me at, uh, at uh, 778-574-4444. Or they can uh, email me at l-r-e-a-u-g-h at a-m-y-m-n dot com. And uh, they can go to our website. Larry, thanks a lot for the update. You're welcome, Jim. I've been speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on June 8th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Jim Pettit, CEO and President of Avon Resources. How's it going, Jim? Things are good. Thanks for having me on again. How's your latest project going? Well, it's uh, the latest plans are all falling in place. I think the last time I had mentioned we'd be out uh, mid-June, possibly drilling by mid-June. 
as of today, we'll have guys boots on the ground next week. Uh, we'll be getting site preparation ready for for the drill. Mobilization is on schedule, so it's going to be right about the middle of the month, 14th, 15th, 16th, right around there. And uh, our intentions are to move right into the zone we finished off. Well, we we hit last year, which was the high grade. Um, holes that we hit the, off the one pad and it's called the north boundary zone um, you know that that had uh, numbers well in in hole 05 because it was three it was four five and six last year out of nine holes hole five uh, encountered 21 and a half grams uh, gold 28 and a half grams silver and three percent copper over six meters uh, we'd like to replicate that but that zone was within a, a larger, broader zone of 122 meters of 1.2 grams. Um, that's the kind of thing we like to see, a very broad zone of mineralization. Uh, the other two holes also had that showing as well. Um, similar grades, uh, varying broad widths though, you know, up to 387 meters in the hole number four and, and uh, about eight, 98, 94 meters, I think, in hole number six. So, you know, we're, we've got a zone. we got to chase it, and that's where we're going to start. Where is all this activity taking place? Well, um, it's up in the Golden Triangle in northwestern B.C. Um, our property is sitting right in the middle of it, um, about halfway between S.K. Creek and the Snip Mines. Uh, it's a long, 50-kilometer uh, long property that runs right along the Kerr Fault, which acts as a major geologic engine for the whole whole region. Uh, perfect location, gives us uh, tremendous discovery upside with the amount of activity, and the geologic activity in that area. Um, I think it's going to be a very good season. Jim, where are you traded and under what symbols? Well, we are traded on the uh, Toronto Stock Exchange, the venture, under the symbol uh, ABN, and on the now on the OTCQB under the symbol ABNAF. And where can people get more information about App and Resources? Contact us here. Either go to the website at um, appandresources.com or you can contact uh, either Don Myers or myself at the office at 604-687-3376. Jim, thanks for the update. You bet. Anytime. Thanks. We've been speaking with Jim Pettit, CEO and President of Avon Resources. I'm Jim Goddard. We were speaking on June 6th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.